welcome you guys. I, um, I was just going to read this chapter, but I felt the presence when we walked on the platform of just the, the presence of the Lord is here, you guys, and let's just recognize that. So everyone, just turn your attention. Turn your attention to the face of Jesus right now, you guys. He's so near. I'm going to read Psalms um, 150, and I'm just going to start in verse 2. So praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with the stringed instruments and flutes. We praise him with loud cymbals. We praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Father, we praise you tonight for your goodness. We praise you tonight for your name's sake, Lord. We fix our eyes on the Lamb of God. We fix our eyes on the cross, Jesus. Lord, I thank you that tonight you are welcomed. You are welcome here tonight, and we recognize you, Jesus. Yes, Lord, we worship you. Can everyone just worship? Just worship him. Jesus, we worship you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
your back, pleading until your final breath. Tears of red, a crown of thorns, you gave it all.
Jesus. Oh, Holy Spirit, I ask that you will renew our strength tonight, Jesus. Restore the wonder in our hearts, Lord Jesus. Restore the childlike faith, Jesus. Restore the joy, Jesus. Holy Spirit, bring us back. Bring us back to when we first fell in love with you, Jesus. 
Bring us back the first time we said Jesus. Bring us back the first time we whispered your name, Jesus. Let us remember, Jesus. Let us remember. Let me remember too, Jesus. Let us remember, Jesus. We're so thankful. Just thank him. Thank him for dying for you. Thank him for the love he's given you. Thank you that he doesn't love you with conditions, that Jesus' love, unlike people's love, his love is unconditional. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you, Jesus, that you, you cover our sin, Lord. You took it on the cross, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, that your word says, as far as the east is from the west, Jesus, you drive it away, Jesus. So we thank you for your blood tonight, Jesus. We thank you, Father. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. I just wanna read this passage real quick while we're just still in a place of worship. I, this passage always ministers to me, and every time I, I read it, it just, it just gives me so much hope. It's in Isaiah 40, and you don't have to turn there, but just you can listen. It says, to whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Ask the Holy One. Look up into the heavens who created all the stars. Listen to this. He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. How can you say Jesus doesn't know you when he knows the stars in the sky? He calls them by name. How much more does he love you, his child? Think of that for a moment. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one, not a star is missing. Oh, Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see your trouble? Oh, Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youth will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. It doesn't just say strength. It says it's new. It's brand new every day. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. We hold on to these promises, Jesus. You are above all, Lord. Your word says you never slumber nor sleep, Jesus. So we trust you, Jesus. Who else can we trust but you, Jesus? Who else can we put our hope in but you, Jesus? So we thank you. We thank you. Jesus, we give you this night. Oh, Lord, save the lost. Come on, agree, church. Save the lost tonight. Heal the sick, Jesus. Break the chains of oppression off your children in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father, for your power. In Jesus' name, amen. If I could um, get a podium, how about our worship team? Thank you, Bruce, for taking me back. <laughs> I felt like it was my childhood all over again with all those songs. And Dom and worship team, you just do them so beautifully. Oh, we're going to have a great night tonight. My, my dad is here. He's going to minister an amazing message to us. Yes. Aren't you thankful to have fathers and mothers that can pour into us? I, I am. I'm just so thankful. But before we get into that, and I just, you know, me and the team were praying in the back. And, and my prayer, not only for you, but for me, was, Lord, touch me afresh tonight. I don't want to get comfortable, you know what I mean? I don't want to get used to this. I don't want to, I want more, you know? I just want more, and I believe the Lord is going to touch us tonight. But it's offering time. It's offering time. And as you guys know, when we give, it's an act of worship. You know, we come in here, we worship to the Lord, we sing, we dance, we praise, we, we do all these, but offering is also a worship. It's part of worship. This is not like a pause and, oh, it's offering time. No, this is a chance for us to worship the King of Kings with our offering. 
What we hold on to belongs to Jesus, right? It's all his. So I have a few verses that I want to share with you real quick. Let's go to Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. I'll just read it, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. So the best part, even the best part of your day belongs to Jesus, okay? We, we speak about first fruits, and we know what that means, right? It's the first, it's whatever, whenever you get paid, the very first goes to Jesus, right? So Michael and I, we don't even touch our paychecks. We give our tithe, and of course, we give offerings as well, because the Bible says to give tithe and offering, but we don't even see that. That goes right to Jesus. It's our first fruits, but we need to also honor him with the first fruits of our day, right? That's why I love praying in the morning, because it's the best part. You just woke up. There's no distress in your head, you haven't turned on the news or looked at Facebook, Ugh. so you don't have to do any of that, you give it to Jesus and he sets the tone for the rest of the day, right? So it says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce, then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. Let's go to Proverbs eleven twenty four through 25. It says, give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. I shared this with you before. Every time I feel like I'm holding tightly to what the Lord has given me, I know that I need to go above and beyond and give more. Because I don't want to be stingy. I want to give it all away. I want to give every, it's not mine anyways. It all belongs to him, right? So when you hold on to things, the Lord can't trust you. But when you give what you have, he trusts you. And he's so good that, that he loves to bless his children, right? Let's go to one more. Proverbs 21, 26. It says, some people are always greedy for more, but the godly love to give, Right? So I'm sharing all these because I, I want us all, me included, I want to go above and beyond and give the best that we have to Jesus. Even when we worship, we're giving him our best, right? If we're sitting there with, with no heart unto him, that's not our best. That's just, we're just existing. So even with what you do with your money shows a lot about what you care about, right? You can either give it to Jesus or, or give it to the world. And we want to give it all. Well, what are you doing? Well, they were looking behind me, so I'll wrap it up. Okay, bring the buckets, and you can text GIVE to the number on your screen. If you're watching online, we'd love to invite you to give as well. You can text GIVE to the number on the screen online. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand, and we will have an usher pass. See, he's ready to preach, so it's going to be a good night. We'll have an usher come and pass it along. All right, you guys know what to do. You can come up to the buckets. All right. Do we even need an offering song? Let's just do it, and he'll cut it off anyways, so we'll be good.
honored to have you here, Dad, tonight. Thank you so much for coming. You, yes, so I think Michael, he made a video. Chris, do, do you have the video? He wanted to announce my dad. I just talked to him. Yeah, I mean, Take your seat. That's so sweet of Michael wanting to do that, but there's no need. They know who I am. But Michael, I love you anyways. Well, how are you doing? You ready? You ready for the Lord to touch you tonight? Can we stand and let's thank him for his mercy? Lord God, I thank you today. Oh, I thank you today for your awesome grace. For your awesome grace. To you be the glory, dear Jesus. Lift your hands and thank him for his mercy. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Where would we be without it? And I pray today you'll bless this wonderful people, your people. Bless Michael and Jessica, bless their ministry. And move mightily tonight among us. Hallelujah. Let's just lift our voices and thank him for his goodness. Come on, lift your voices and thank him for his mercy and his goodness. Blessed be the Lord God. Hallelujah. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty who reigns forevermore. Blessed be the Lord. Oh, lift your voice and say, Who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord, Almighty, who reigns forevermore. Blessed be the Lord,
voice that sings, glorify your name, glorify your name, glorify your name, glorify your name in all the earth. Dear Jesus, we love you, we praise you, we adore you, glorify your name in all the earth. Tonight, Lord, glory. Lord, touch us afresh, I pray tonight. Quicken our minds. Quicken our hearts to receive your word. And Lord, I ask you today to quicken my mind that I may deliver this word with clarity. That your people will receive it we live the kind of life you want us to live pleasing to you. We do not trust our hearts. We trust you and only you. We have no confidence in our own self. Our confidence is in you. So touch us. Renew us, empower us for the coming days in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All right. I want you all to go to Romans chapter 6. I'm doing good, babe. Thanks. So let's talk about something very important tonight. You know, <clears throat> when Michael and Jessica and I were talking last night, <clears throat> we were kind of talking about what to bring to you today. And uh, Jesse said, well, Dad, you know, Michael has been teaching on the Holy Spirit Maybe it'll be something you can talk about. I said, well, let the Lord talk to me. And finally, last night I thought, Lord, what would you have the people here? What is it you want to talk to them about? I can, I'm not boasting, I can preach a million messages, you know. Got them all. Over about 49 years of ministry, I should have them there. Well, the Lord gave me a word for you that I really want to minister. But can I please give you back the tea first? Yeah, thank you. Just in case I move my hand when I'm, you know, <laughs> get a little excited and that tea will be flying all over the place. Oh, Bruce, bless you. 
All right, I want to talk to you first about how do you enjoy, how to really enjoy spiritual food, spiritual nourishment. How do you get the Bible into your life in a way you're going to really, really enjoy it? Now, what I want to talk to you about tonight is not something you're going to hear a lot. And that is how to chew the cud. Like the cow, you know. No. The word of God cannot be received unless we meditate upon the word. Now, I don't expect you young people, a lot of you are young people, how many are between, let's say, 20 and 30? Well, the whole congregation. <laughs> Almost. How many feel 20 or 30? Oh, good. When I was your age, when I was young, I didn't think the way I think today about the Bible. Today I see the Bible in a whole different way. I'll give you a little example. And I don't want you to all think, oh my God, I don't think I can do that. Yeah, you can, and you will. I've just read, see, I read my Bible one time, like once through every four months. You say, how do you do that? Simplicito. Easy. I just began reading the word. Uh, today is June what? 13, 13. So I began reading Genesis 1 on June 2nd. I'm already in Leviticus. So I've gone through all of Genesis, all of Exodus, and I can give you every chapter from memory. I don't expect you to be there right now. But you need to get there quick. Here's why. The days ahead are very dark. And very dangerous. And I really, I worry more about my children and my grandchildren than myself about the future. Because now things are getting real bad. I've lived through three wars in my life. Think about that. You sweet people in America haven't lived through one yet. Three wars in my lifetime. I'm 69. When I was four... I still remember the 1956 war in Israel. I was only four. Then 1967, the 67 war, when we were digging ditches, we were thinking we we're going to all die, you know, in Israel. And then next war was called the War of Attrition, where the Egyptians were attacking the Israelis on the Suez. And then my daddy said, we've had enough of this. We're going to immigrate. Thank God. I am more worried about the future of my children than I was worried about the wars when I was a kid and a young man, teenager. Because the war we fight today is nothing like the one in the past. The one in the, in the past, you knew who your enemy was. Today, you don't know who your enemy is. He may be your next door neighbor. See? We knew who we were fighting. We were fighting uh, whatever the, the Israelis were fighting, the Egyptians and Jordanians and Syrians and all that. Today, in today's war, it has become so demonic. See? Yes, it's spiritual. Of course, all wars are spiritual. The source is spiritual, no matter what they are. But the future war that is coming, which I think has begun, is so, so demonic. I mean, Satan's plan is to destroy the work of God on earth. Of course he can't. And he won't. He'll never succeed. He's, he's, a, he's a loser anyways. Believe me, he's a, he's a big loser. 
And I don't want you, I don't want you to be afraid of the devil. Look, I don't want to scare you. I've seen his majesty twice. I used to be scared of him. I don't anymore. Because I saw the power of God. The first time the devil came at me, I saw his face like I see yours. 1973. When the power of the Holy Spirit was so rich in my life, and I saw him come like this, like rise out of the ground like this. Hate, I never saw in my life like that. The feeling in my, in my bedroom, I, I couldn't describe it to you. And suddenly be, be, between he and I, the most beautiful cloud showed up. And I went to sleep right away. It was like a cover came over me, like a beautiful blanket. And, and, and I could still see the devil's face, but I did not care. I went right to sleep. Right to sleep. He's still there with all the hate. The Lord came between he and I. Ooh, the power of God is so great. There's nothing the devil can do to you. Nothing. As long as you're walking with the Lord. I want to tell you something. And, and, and the reason I'm talking like this is, is because I, I believe and I think I'm right. Some of you are going to have some challenges in the future. And unless you prepare today, today, not tomorrow, through the scriptures that I'm going to share with you, and how to receive the scriptures in your life. Not just reading so you can just say, well, I read it. That's not good enough. So, but I share this with you to just show you how strong the Lord is. So, before I began preaching, I said, Lord. And now look, I began preaching when I was 21. I'm 69 now, so 21 years old. I said, Lord, I don't know if I want to preach. <laughs> I think the Lord was really laughing when I said that to him. You know, God has an amazing sense of humor. So I said, Lord, I don't know that I want to preach because I don't want the devil to become real. I'm not really looking for that. Because I knew the second you pray for the sick, the minute you become uh, a minister of the gospel in the, in the way where the supernatural flows through you, the demonic will become real. It's a very powerful world out there. And I said, Lord, I don't think I want that. Let me just, you know, do, do something for you, and kind of simple, you know. <laughs> so I'm asleep. And suddenly in my room, before God Almighty, I'm telling you the truth, okay? Because God will judge me if I add anything to it, to it or take away anything. In front of me, I, I woke up. I was wide awake. I woke up. I see this massive being in front of me with a black hood, black robe. I didn't see his face. Nails that were quite long and kind of curly. And he came at me to choke me. This spirit of death is really what it was. So I cried, dear Jesus. And suddenly, to my shock, I came out of my body. Only half of me came out of my body. I'm sitting up. My legs are still in. From the waist, I'm up. I look back, I see myself. Motionless. Did I die? I don't know. Frankly, I don't care at all because I was alive. <laughs> but that thing behind me was completely motionless. Dead or not, it doesn't matter. I'm sitting up. And suddenly an angel, before the Lord may strike me dead, if I'm telling you the, anything that's, that is not truth. An angel rushes in, takes that big thing and sh shoves him towards the wall. And that angel was... A little bit shorter than that big guy. It didn't matter though. He held him. 
And then another angel comes in and stands right next to me. Beautiful angel. Oh, blonde hair. You'll see when I, we get to heaven, I'm going to show them to you. <laughs> blonde hair. Curly blonde hair. Wide, beautiful eyes, blue eyes. On his chest was a belt of gold. Massive shoulders. He stood maybe seven foot. I don't know how tall he was. I'm staring at him in awe, complete awe. Never seen anyone like that in my life. And he just stared at me. He didn't say a word. He didn't even smile. He just stood there. Now that black robed angel was still there, fighting, trying to, to come my way and choke me. <laughs> he couldn't even move that man or that devil, whatever he was. And a third angel comes in and says, and says to the beautiful angel in front of me, he called him Michael. He said, Michael, twice he said, he said, Michael, Michael, someone else is in trouble. And he says to him with this deep voice comes out of him, he says, you look after him and gone. The second he is gone, I'm back in my body singing, hallelujah. <laughs> That actually happened. I'm back in my body. I think, hallelujah, hallelujah. And that thing, I could still see him by the, by, the, by the wall. I didn't see the angels at all. I just saw him stuck there. I had no fear whatsoever. When I woke up in the morning, I was scared to death. Like... The, the Lord shut my emotions off while all this is going on. And in the, in the morning, <laughs> my God, I pray it'll never happen again. <laughs> all that. But I saw the power of God. And from there on, I had one thought about the devil. Not one time. The other time he came, <laughs> brother, you remember that guy from Hollywood who came and offered me a position in Hollywood? Oh, brother. He was a big, big man. <laughs> Walk like that. He was a big, famous guy. He would, he, would, he would come in his limo to our church and sit there and cry. But he was of the devil, that guy. And he did some big movies. And he invited all of us on his yacht. You came with us one time, I think, well, Jim came anyway, but you remember the, the dear boy there. So he says, listen, he says, uh, why don't you come see me down by Disney? He had a massive suite. So I went over there and didn't know what the guy wanted. He looked at me, he said, he's sitting on this big chair. He says, I'm going to make you a movie star. I'm like, well, okay. He says, you got a gift. It needs to be on the screen. I said, I am not interested. I don't want it. He cussed me out with the filthiest words out of his mouth. He was such a nice guy when he came to church. He sat there and cried. And we all thought maybe we would, you know, get him saved. He came with a, with a, with a purpose to make me some big movie star. And when I said no to him, he just went, crazy on me and I walked out that hotel is still there right there by Disney every time I go by they say oh that's where that boy came <laughs> that night I have a dream the devil shows up he says I'll give you anything you want just say yes to him to that man I screamed no and here's something I think is so sweet. When, when the devil came in that dream and said, I'll give you anything you want, just say yes to that. And he gave me his name, so I don't want to say his name, that boy's name. The Lord was standing right in the shadows, just in case. Ooh. 
Oh, that made me feel so good. I saw his arm and his robe just standing there, just waiting, like, in case Benny needs me, I'm here. What, can we throw him a kiss? Jesus is so sweet. Mwah! The Lord is always there for you. Don't ever be afraid of that devil. Did you hear that? Yes. Now listen, listen. Wait, wait. I used to always tell, tell, tell pe people that. If you have a message for the devil, write it on the bottom of your shoe. <laughs> Say that. <laughs> Say it, come on. If you have a message for the devil, what? Smash his face, be done with it. Now, all of you say, I was born to win. I was born to succeed. I will succeed in Jesus. Amen. Now, for, for you to succeed, and you know, like I've just been saying to you, you have nothing to fear. Do not be afraid of the devil. But you do have to fear another enemy that's more, uh, how shall I say, he's more difficult to deal with. That's the flesh. You know, the Bible says, resist the devil and he'll flee, right? You cannot resist the flesh. That flesh is with you in bed. Nowhere in the Bible does, does it say resist the flesh and the flesh will flee. No. It says resist the devil and he'll flee. So you can, you can resist the devil and he'll run every time like a coward. But the flesh has to be crucified. Big difference between the flesh and the devil. You have to say no to that flesh. But you cannot and will not have the authority without the word in you. So... I'm going to talk to you about how to digest, I mean digest, the scriptures. And I'll give you an example in just a little bit. But let's begin reading Romans 6, okay? I'm going to read about 14 verses because that kind of explains our life as God sees us today. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? See, you and I have been born again. It's not God's will for you to continue in sin. God forbid, he said in verse 2. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now, what does it mean by dead to sin? It means that Jesus already overcame Sin cannot control your life. All you have to do is say yes to Jesus and no to sin. Quite simple. Every true Christian has the power to say no to sin. I won't do it. I just won't. I won't look at that thing. I won't let those friends in my life. We all have that power. Know ye not, verse 3, that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? And he's talking here about the flesh dying to self, the flesh dying to the things of the world. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So he's talking about a baptism into death. This is not water baptism here. Water baptism is simply the declaration that I'm really dead already to sin. But when I become a Christian, I so surrender to the Lord, I die to the things I want. And I live to the things that are his will for me. I don't live for myself, I live for him. And we all have that power to actually do that. 
to surrender to the Lord like that. Verse 5, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So anyone who says yes to the Lord and no to the flesh, one day will see a mighty resurrection of the new life and then the resurrection of the body, of course. Knowing this, verse 6, that our old man, the flesh, is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. The minute we say no to the flesh, sin has no place to go. That the, it, it says that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Verse 7, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, what does it mean by freed from sin? It doesn't mean that you'll never sin again because we all stumble here and there. It means sin will not control you. Dead to sin means sin is no longer your boss. You are the boss now. Sin has no power to love, to control your life. I love this. Verse 8. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, or meaning for sin. In that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, this is the whole key, reckon ye also yourselves. And the word reckon is an old English word, means consider yourselves to be dead, to be dead, I should say, indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's really as simple as it can be really said. We just consider ourselves dead to the flesh, to the things of the flesh. We can say no to it. I don't want it. What did Job say? I have made a covenant with mine eyes not to look upon a woman. I have told these eyes not to look, and that's all there is to it. Simplicito. But you can't do that if the word is not in you. And then he says in verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Meaning you can say no. Otherwise you would not say let not sin reign in your body. Because we, we, we all have the authority to say no. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, because you can say no to the body. Don't yield your body as an instrument for sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, meaning that Jesus gave you the power of life within you to say no to the sins of the world. You're alive now. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin, and this is the promise, sin shall not have dominion over you, meaning it's been taken away. That dominion is no longer running your life. But if you decide, well, I love my sin too much, then it will become your boss again. If you yield to sin, sin will control you again and destroy you at the end. Yet you have the power. When you come and say, Jesus, come into my heart, save my soul. You don't feel it, but the power of God comes into your being and you walk away with a new um, amazing part to say, no devil, I don't want you. And there's nothing he can do. Yeah, he may tempt you, but you still have power to say no. Quite simple. All right. Now, let me talk about how all this beauty can come your way as you begin to live the Christian life. So the minute you say yes to Jesus, 
and no to sin, God requires something of everyone of, of us. In the scriptures, in Exodus chapter 16 and verse 4, please try not to move about when I'm teaching the word. Please. I'm really nice to you tonight. Thank you. Now, God said to Israel, he, he said now, and I'm going to paraphrase. He said, I'm going to send you food every morning. And I'm not sending it to your tent. I'm going to put it in the desert somewhere. And you have to go find it. Every day. Every day you need to leave your tent and go look for it. And come back with it into the tent and cook it and cook it and eat it. It was called manna. God gave them a responsibility. He said, I am not going to put that manna in the tent. I'm going to put it in the desert so you have to go find it. And they did it every day for 40 years. It took discipline huh? and obedience to go out to the desert every morning looking for the manna. In fact, I think it will be nice to read that verse, don't you think? Let's go to Exodus chapter 16. We're going to look <clears throat> at verse 4. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day. Why? That I may prove them. And the word prove them here, test them. Whether they will walk in my law or no. How many of you have read the whole Bible? Wave. Good. Beautiful. I'm not going to ask how many have not. I don't want to embarrass you. But every single day, those dear people, the Israelites, had to go look for it. And God said, I want to test you. Are you going to obey me by going out to look for it and eat it? So we believers have a responsibility. <clears throat> we too have got to go and find it somewhere. It's called the word of God. Manna from heaven. Now, Jesus said, let's go to John chapter 6. Jesus said in John 6 and verse 32. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give evermore give us this bread and Jesus said unto them I am the bread of life he that cometh to me shall never hunger he that believeth on me shall never thirst now here we have a picture of God's word and don't ever forget we feed upon the Lord Jesus himself as we feed upon his word. Feeding on God's word is feeding on Christ the Lord. God's word is the Lord. So, I want to I just say something here real fast. I don't think anyone is young enough in the Lord to go out and find the manna. I think anyone, if, you were, if, if you're one day old in the faith, 
It's your responsibility to go look for it, God's word. Let's, let's go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8. Because, you know, some people say, well, you know, I'm still very young in the spirit and I don't understand some parts of the Bible and maybe I should wait till I'm older. No, no, no. Everyone is responsible. No matter how young you are in the Lord, you begin to read the scriptures even if you don't understand them. Because you will eventually understand them. I'll, I'll give you some examples that happened in my life. Just keep listening. But look at Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. And he humbled. Now this is Moses speaking to the newer generation of Israel. Whose, whose families, or moms and dads had died already in the wilderness, most of them. And this is the new generation of young people who did not remember Egypt. So some of them were born in the desert. And the, and, the, and the name Deuteronomy means second law. It's the second time around to give the law, basically. And so he says this, And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know. Why? that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word, say every word, every that word. proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. How beautiful. Now, <clears throat> let me say a few things to you quick. Some people have questioned the Bible. Is it really God's word? Is it truly accurate? I've seen some contradictions, therefore I don't know if I believe it like I used to, all that stuff. Well, first of all, there are no contradictions in the Bible. It's a matter of translation. And I know it from experience. Because I have also thought that when I was young, oh, it says something different here than here. I am today a student of Hebrew University. I've been in that amazing university for about three years now. Every Monday at 5 p.m. I'm in class. And I'm really good at it. <laughs> I'm the, and I'm the only student in the class. Because <laughs> I paid enough money to be the only student in the class. <laughs> and I have an amazing professor. Sigal Zohar is her name. It's an older lady, a boy. She is tough like nails. We've become good, good friends now for the last three years. And every Monday at 5 on social media, she comes on and I'm ready for her. And she is brilliant with Hebrew and knows the history of the Bible. And so as we've kind of, you know, gotten to know each other in the Hebrew language is not exactly like I thought it was. It's very difficult, but it's amazing to be, to be honest with you, just so deep. So I said, why is there some contradictions here? And I showed it to her. Ah, she said. She said, when they wrote the Bible, the original of the originals, there were nothing in it like that. Later, it was translated into Greek, called the Septuagint. And she said, all English translations are translations of the Greek. The Old Testament in Greek. And this is where the problem is. So she said, but I'm going to send you, through email, the original Old Testament. And she did. And the difference, you see it, so beautiful, that there's nothing there that is out of place. The translators just kind of messed up a little bit. 
And then when the King James was translated, they just missed some words. In fact, it's the closest to the Hebrew that you, you, can, you, you can read. The King James Bible is the safest in my opinion. Still though, the Hebrew language is not very, very easy to translate. It's very difficult because of all the vowels and the little things you see that look like you know, upside down commas and all that. I don't want to get into that to mess your head up, but it's quite interesting. Yeah. Like one little dot in a letter can change the whole meaning of the word. Just a little dot. So I don't want to get into that right now. But the word of God is remarkably amazing. I'm going to give you just a little example here to show you how amazing the Bible is. Are you ready for this? If you read Genesis chapter 5, don't do it now. Don't, don't, uh, uh, uh. Just, just listen to me. Huh? And you translate the names from Adam to Noah, you have the entire gospel of Jesus. Did you know that? How many did? Oh, good, because I told you. How many had no idea? Put your hands up high. Okay, if you translate the names from Adam to Noah, it says, man appointed. The name Seth means appointed. Man, Adam, means man. His son is Seth, appointed. Man appointed. Mortal. These are the translations of the, of the names Okay, just the names, if you translate them. Man, and this is all in Genesis 5. Man appointed mortal sorrow. But the blessed God shall come down, declaring that his death will bring the despairing rest. The name Methuselah means his death will bring. And Noah means rest. The whole gospel is in the names. And people question the Bible. <laughs> How can they question the Bible? Now, one other thing you don't know. If you look at the names of the sons of Jacob, it's your life in Jesus. Did you know that? Oh, brother. I'm going to send you all the lists so you can have it for yourself. <laughs> Stick it on your fridge. I'll tell you what I'll do, baby. I'll send you the list and you and Michael send it to the whole church. And they can, and they can show it to their, they can show it to their friends and say, see, how can the Bible uh, not be the Bible? Come on, please. It's no way. Like Reuben means behold the sun. You knew that, come on. Simeon means hear him. Shimon. Levi means be, be attached to him, follow him. Judah means praise him. Every name in the Bible has to do with your walk with God. Right to Benjamin, we are seated in heavenly places. It's amazing to me. Now, Prophecy is the proof the Bible is God's word. Think about this. 332 prophecies fulfilled in details when Jesus came to earth. In details. And hundreds more will be fulfilled when he returns. Every prophecy concerning the Jewish people returning to their homeland fulfilled in details in 1948. Details. Almost mind-boggling. How many of you, uh, your forefathers came from another country? Sweden, Norway, whatever. Wave. Okay. Now think about this. Think about this. You don't speak Swedish or Norwegian or whatever language your great-great-grandpapa spoke. God said to the Jews, he said, when you come back, 
you, you'll still speak Hebrew. And that's after 2,000 years. 2,000 years. How can a language survive for 2,000 years? My children don't speak Hebrew or Arabic or French. I spoke all three languages. Smart little me. <laughs> I had to. I went to a French school, and that was the way it was. My kids don't speak Arabic, and they don't speak it. It's only one generation, and they don't speak it. Think about 2,000 years. Only God can do that. It's in the Bible. So anyone who questions the Bible is not a believer. Now, we believers need to understand how to receive it. So, I've seen cows, by the way, grazing. I remember going to a place called Bizak Center. That's where I learned all the hymns. I would sit on a rock with a hymnal, and, and I memorized all, well, many of the hymns, looking at cows this far away from me, chewing their food over and over and over and over. And I, you know, I didn't think much about it back, back, back then. A bunch of cows all, all around me, and I'm, I'm thinking I'm in heaven singing, all hail the power of Jesus' name with that cow listening. <laughs> it was a glorious, glorious years in my life back, back then. So many, many of you have, have most likely seen a cow grazing, and most of, of the time they are, they are nibbling, or as they say, uh, you know, endlessly munching. And they call that chewing the cud where they chew the grass over and over to get all the nutrition out of it. This is what the Bible means by meditation. So when I read the word, I begin to meditate. I'm going to give you a wonderful example that happened to me yesterday, just yesterday. I have read... Exodus, many times where God gave, can you people handle a little meat? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Lift your hands and say, Lord, help me now. Yes. I've always wondered about God's uh, instructions to Moses about the tabernacle and the order he gave him, the order. So he begins with the ark. He said, build the ark. Then he says, the table of showbread. Then he said, the lampstand. Then he talks about the covers. Then he talks about the structure. Then he talks about the altar of sacrifice, then the labor, then the altar of incense, and then the priesthood's garment. I've always wondered, why that order? Why that order? And I began to think about it yesterday. I thought over and over, and I went through every piece in my head. Ark of the Covenant table of showbread, lampstand, the four covers, the linen and the goat's hair and the ram skin dyed red and the badger skin. And I'm going through that in my head. 57 poles or pillars. I'm going through all that in my head. Five boards going through them to hold them together, all that. I know this may sound boring to you. It's marvelous. It's exciting. God was revealing the beauty of Jesus from his descent to earth, his miracle ministry, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension and present ministry. In that, just in that order, he goes to the ark, glory that came down became the bread of life wow. <laughs> Woo! forgive me I'm just that became the light of the world that became a man took upon him our sin down on a cross no beauty in him that should be seen in the, in just in the covers died and bled on Calvary, the altar of sacrifice, washed the church with his word, the labor, ascended back to heaven, the altar of incense, his priesthood, 
and then the ministry of the high priest forever. In that order. Did you listen to that? It blew me away. I began crying. I'm thinking, God is revealing every step of Jesus by giving that order. It happened when I was doing... <laughs> chewing the word. Are you people listening? Yes. The Bible is so exciting when you begin to meditate. I think about the Bible when I'm laying in bed, even in the shower. Believe me, I have the most amazing times in my shower. <laughs> because I'm thinking about all that I've read. Oh, the Lord is so amazing. So amazing. But the most amazing times I have is when I'm laying down quietly and I go through it in my head. That nourishment comes into your being. Oh. Who wants to watch CNN? Forget it. <laughs> Who wants to watch Fox News? Enough of that. Who wants to watch all the stuff on TV that messes your head? Get the Bible in and have marvelous feasts. <laughs> but you see, it's not about reading. You can read that list of God giving to Moses this and mean nothing to you. Oh, it's boring. I don't know about that. You know, no. It's Jesus. Amazing. You know those 60 poles outside that made the fence. Can I give you a little secret? Can you really handle this? Yes or no? Okay, now. One pole made out of wood called acacia. You know what acacia wood is symbolic of? Come here, Ryan. Stand right here. It's symbolic of flesh. And acacia wood is like olive wood that has a long life, meaning eternal flesh. Yeah. And God said on every pole, and I don't have time to go through why 60. There was 60 of them around. He said on every pole, put a silver cap. Why? Redeemer. On the bottom, brass. Savior. Because brass is symbolic of suffering. Silver redemption. And then he said, turn, turn around a second. And, and then he said, I want you to tie a rope to it made out of goat's hair. Goat's hair. Why? Goat's hair is symbolic of sin and deception. In the Bible. You should know that. Well, you will. And then he said, make sure it has 11 strips on it. Why? Because 11 is the number of destruction in the Bible. Didn't you, didn't you know that? I'll give it to you. Number, <laughs> number one speaks of oneness. Two, witness. Three, Trinity, four, the world, five, come on, you should know all this, grace, six, men, seven, perfection, eight, new beginnings, nine, power, ten, responsibility, eleven, destruction, twelve, administration, thirteen, witchcraft. That's in the Bible. Nim Nimrod was the thirteenth from Noah. Witchcraft. Wow. Why don't you learn your own Bible so I don't have to tell you this? <laughs> no, no, I'd love to come back and tell you this. And then he said, I want you to attach a brass nail to it on the, when it goes in the ground and make sure it only goes halfway in. So here's the message. The man Jesus, eternal, redeemer, savior, took upon him my sin, destroyed it, died, the nail going in. But he said half of it needs, needs, needs to be seen and rose from the dead. All in a pole, in silver, brass, a rope, and a nail. How anybody cannot enjoy the Bible is beyond me. And that's just a little 
a little, uh, a little, you know, appetizer. The old covenant is full of glory if you really read it with the eyes of the Holy Spirit. So, are you enjoying this? Yes. Keep listening. So, this, this chewing, this meditating is when you consider... It's, and it's, it's more than a mental thing, you know. It's, it's more a mental. Meditation in the spirit is spiritual, not mental. Yes, of course, the mind is, you know, involved and all that. But it's the Holy Spirit who takes over. And so Bible study and Bible meditation over often overlap. You go from study to meditation... But there is a, a, a very big difference between Bible study and meditation. Because Bible study, it's the mind that's involved intellectually. While meditation, it's the spirit that becomes active rather than the mind. Because meditation focuses on the heart even though the mind is used, it still focuses on the, on the heart. Now, let's go to Psalm 19, verse 7, please, all of us. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give you some examples in just a second. Because my purpose tonight is one thing. To cause you to fall in love with the Bible like you never have in your life. Because that's the thing that will guarantee your longevity as a Christian. That nothing can shake you. No devil can knock you down. Say amen. amen. So it says in Psalm 19 verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Meaning if you read the word of God, it will have an impact on your soul that will last for the rest of your life. The testimony of the Lord is sure, is sure, Making wise the simple. Making so many simple men and women wise in the spirit. I read a story about a, an old farmer who went to speak at a conference. And uh, a young man looked at his friend. He said, who's the speaker? He said, Is that, it's that farmer up there. And the young man kind of groaned and said, oh, I'm going to have to endure this one. But when that farmer got up to speak, the power of God hit that room. And he and his friend, this guy that was sitting there and his friend came up and asked that dear farmer. He said, how come the power of God came on so strong when you came up on that platform? He said, well... Every morning I read the word of God and then I go out to my farm and I meditate. Wow. So, uh, the process of meditation, and this is the key here, okay? The process of meditation uh, has uh, three different phases. Lift your hands, say, now, just lift your hands, say, Lord, help me get all this. In Jesus' name. So it, it has three different um, phases. Phase number one, when you read the Bible, first, apprehension. Apprehension is found in Psalm 119. Because I want you to really see this. The minute you, you begin to meditate upon the word... Something happens to you. Okay. And I'm going to read. Uh, let me go back here. Psalm 119 verse 99. Psalm 119 and verse 99. I'll be ministering to you in just a little bit. I believe the power of God is going to start flowing here. But I have got to get this through to you. I have more understanding than all my teachers, it says. For thy testimonies are my meditations. Look at me, all of you, please. 
I was sharing with Chad last night the whole book of Exodus, and he was like, he was glued like glue. And I said, it's really quite simple. It's a love story. In Exodus 1, Joseph dies. That generation dies. A new king comes on the throne who doesn't know Moses. Persecution begins for the Jewish people. God calls Moses. He reveals himself to Moses in chapter 3. He sends him to Egypt in chapter 4. The plagues begin, all 11 of them. 11 plagues from the rod being turned into a serpent to the death of the firstborn. And so by that time, you're in chapter 12. Now, now God takes them out of Egypt, splits the Red Sea for them. They come to a place called Mara later, and he proves them. Will they obey or not? And then God has an amazing announcement. He says, Moses, I think it's time we all have a family gathering. Get the whole country together. Make sure they clean up themselves and show up by morning. And God comes from heaven with a mighty fire. Oh, my. And the trumpet sounds. And God has a meeting with his people. Amazing. And he says, and I'm going to kind of paraphrase, have no other gods. You worship me only. No graven image. Don't ever bow to a statue. Don't ever use my name in vain. Honor the Sabbath. Honor your mom and dad. Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Don't covet. Don't be greedy. And the meeting is over. Quick paraphrase. What a mighty act of love. God wanting a big meeting, a big gathering with his people. Then he says, Moses, come up and bring all the elders with you. Let's have lunch. Wow. They eat with God. Then God says, you come by yourself. I have a plan. I don't want you coming up here anymore. I'm coming down. Build me a tent. Gives him the whole plan. He builds that marvelous place called the tabernacle. And God comes and dwells. And from chapter 25 to the end, that's all we read is about the tabernacle, basically. That's the whole book. And you think about every major headline in that book, and you're awed. What a God. And we all know that right after he gave those Ten Commandments, they built a calf and worshipped it. God didn't change his promise. He was still there for them. I want to know that God. I want to know his mind. I want to know his nature. I'm falling in love with him every time I read that book. The more I see his love, the more I want to love him. Life has no meaning without knowing Jesus. I was born and you were born. Our parents made the decision without knowing that we were born for one reason. Not to know them, but to know the Lord. The whole reason for life is to know one person. Jesus. That's it. Yeah, mom, dad brought me into the world. Thank God for that. But they're gone now. They're not my mom and my dad anymore. You say, how's that? They're not. The Bible is clear. 
when my mom and my father forsake me, meaning when they die, the Lord will raise me and take me up. And David said, who do I have in heaven but you, Lord? Not mommy and daddy and papa and mama and grandma. I'm not going to go to heaven to see my mom and my dad. I'm going to heaven to see Jesus. They'll be there with me, but I'm going for him, not for them. Are you listening? The more you read the Bible, the more that love in you just like blows up like a volcano inside of you. And it secures you from the devils of hell tomorrow. Look, hell is real and I don't want you going there. Did you hear me? Not only does the Bible tell us hell is real, I've seen it. Did I ever tell you that? How many have heard me tell about that? How many have not? Put your hands up high. I want to shake you. I stood in my bedroom one day and I looked up. I said, dear Jesus, this was April of 74. Dear Jesus, why are you doing all this in my life? And I was having the most amazing experiences you could ever dream. A human being appeared in my room as well as I see that girl right there. On fire. Lit up. Flames coming out of his body. And he wasn't even touching the floor. And he was making a sound I can still hear. Gnashing his teeth just like Jesus said. I began screaming. No, 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 no. And nobody heard me. And our house is a small place. I I was amazed my mom and my dad didn't come running up to say what's wrong with you. Nobody heard me. And I heard a massive voice from all around me say, Preach the gospel. As I'm screaming, no, no, no. Because I was so frightened. That night I have a dream. Before God, I'm telling you the truth. I see an angel. He looks and said, come with me. Suddenly I'm with him and he suddenly has a chain in his hand. Golden chain. He I look up, it's attached to the sky, looks like a massive door. He swings it open, and I see people, 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 people everywhere, as far as I can see. He says again, come with me, and now we're on top of of that crowd looking down. And I see crowds, crowds, masses walking towards this valley. I look in shock. I see this massive valley with liquid fire shooting out of it. And then to my horror, I see people in it. Their faces coming in, going out, coming in, going out. All of them making the same sounds with their teeth. And I heard a voice. Preach the gospel. If you do not, everyone that falls is your responsibility. And I woke up shaken. I said, Lord, if this is you talking to me, have Pastor Jim tonight tell me that. Jim McAllister was my pastor back then in in Canada. And I would go every Sunday night and Sunday morning to different churches. So that was on Saturday night. Sunday morning, I am at Pastor Jim McAllister. Sunday night at Maxwell White's. And I said, please tell Pastor Jim to tell me that. That that I know this is you. A guest speaker that night is there instead of the pastor who was sitting back behind him. And the guest speaker looks and says, I can't preach till I say something to someone sitting right there. It was my face. (laughs) Word for word. If you don't preach every soul that will fall, that, that falls is your responsibility. And I froze. Then I knew I had to preach the gospel. Why do you think I've been preaching it since I've been uh, 21 years old? Hell is real and I don't want you one of those faces going in and out of the fire. God's word will keep you out of it. And believe me, it's real. Be glad you're alive tonight to still make a decision not to go there. Because anyone who goes there, there's no way out. No way out. 
I heard of two preachers. One of them was a healing evangelist that I knew personally. When he died, he was screaming, they're coming to get me, they're coming. And he was frightened. Demons were coming to get him. But I've seen saints pass. One, one of them was my mom. The joy of the Lord on her face. She was worshiping. I have it on my phone. My precious girl was there. My mom was worshiping with tears in our eyes as she's worshiping Jesus before she gave her last breath. What a beautiful way to go home. Let me tell you something. Heaven is real. And since heaven is real, hell is real. And yes, there is a hell. And I don't want you going there. And you that don't know the Bible, you're in danger that your soul may be sifted away like this from you. A pastor here in Orlando, Florida, at a big church, used to work with us. I took him to Patmos, Greece. I'm doing the book of Revelation. He sits there for four programs, didn't say a word. Finally, I said, listen, I paid your way, your first class. It's time for you to work. He says, I know nothing about the book. I said, what? He said, I know nothing about the book of Revelation. I've never read it. I said, what other books have you not read? He gives me a list. He said, well, I read Genesis and I read Exodus. and I didn't read all of Leviticus and he goes on and on. I said, you're in danger. I said, what are you doing being a pastor? What do you preach? He, he, he said, sermons. I said, from where? He said, from books. I said, what kind of books? Oh, come on, Pastor Benny. Word for word. You're dealing with God's agenda for the ages. I have to deal with my people's troubles. I don't have time to read the Bible. He said that. I said, listen here. The devil will destroy you one day if you don't know the Bible. I said, you can't be giving God's people some books, some whatever some man has said. He said, I have no time to read the Bible. I said, then you're in danger. He went to New York, got overdosed with drugs and died. And that's a fact. Because his wife told my wife what happened to him. People that don't know the Bible are a target to the devil. I don't want you to be one of them. Are you listening? Yes. Then start doing what the Bible says. Read the word. And now you have to apprehend it. When you begin to think about what you read, it's called apprehension. And apprehension is quite simple. I have more understanding than my teachers. For your testimonies are my meditation. You begin to understand what you've read there. That's what apprehension means. It doesn't just mean nothing to you when you read it. Number two. Number two is called assimilation. Assimilation is it's, it's more than understanding. It's feeding the spirit. It's not enough to take spiritual food. You have to digest the food just like you do with the normal stuff. You can chew all you want. But your stomach has to digest it before it is nourishment to you. The same with meditation. First you understand it. It's like when you pick up the food, natural food, and you taste it and you chew it, okay? But then you have to swallow it in the natural. The same with the word. You swallow the word into your spirit. And that happens as you meditate over and over and over upon the scriptures you've just read. You're chewing and you're swallowing. You're chewing and you're swallowing. You're chewing and you're swallowing. And that word is getting into your spirit man drip by drip by drip by drip till your spirit man becomes just like Jesus. Because he is the word. And that assimilation is so powerful, 
It's that Holy Ghost digestive system. This is the real heart of meditation. It's a process. People can eat, but they'll never be nourished if they throw it up. They don't keep it in. They can taste it. They can chew it. But if it doesn't digest, they throw it up. A lot of Christians are throwing it up too. They're not allowing the Lord to give them that amazing digestive spiritually. You know, digestive system. So you and I have to develop our spiritual digestive system because our spiritual food forms spiritual character in us. Like your physical food makes your body what it should be, you know. If you eat bad, you're going to live bad physically. You're going to get sick. If you nourish your spirit, it begins to develop in you a character like the Lord. Look at Psalm 63. This is beautiful. It's beautiful. Are you learning anything, people? You know, I just wanted tonight just to come and really, really encourage you to please never neglect the Bible. Psalm 63 verse 5 says, My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. Watch this. When I remember thee upon my bed... And meditate only in the night watches. Wow, that's what I've been doing lately. Meditate only in the night watches. And that brings what? Satisfaction. It says my soul shall be satisfied. That happens because of assimilation. And Paul talks about this in Colossians chapter 3. Where he says in Chapter 3, verse 16, he says this. He said, let the word of Christ, watch this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. I used to go to a fellowship called St. Matthew when I was your age. We would sit on the floor with guitars and tambourines. And we would just share what God was showing us. And kids would pack that little hall on the floor. Singing the beautiful praise songs of the 70s. And all we did is talk about what did God show us through his word. We didn't have a guest speaker. We, We didn't have anyone who came to minister. Rarely ever. I remember one time in all those years that somebody came. But it was always someone from the group that would share what God had showed them. It was the most wonderful time, I think, in my life. I never missed those meetings on Friday nights. Why don't you people do that? Invite some friends from school and from church and sit and have a nice little cup of coffee (laughs) with your Bible open and sit on the floor and talk about the Word and what the Lord showed you. Ooh, you'd have such a good time. Don't Don't do anything else that the world does. That's all empty. It will enrich you. It will stay with you for the rest of your life. Oh, dear Lord. And that helps all of us. And that's what it says here. Not only let the word of Christ dwell within you, but also teaching, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace. Go there and sit with your holy jeans on the floor. <laughs> I'll never wear them, but you, 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 you can wear them. They have your tattoos and your earrings and your crazy looking hair. Just go there. Just sit down. <laughs> Enjoy the Lord. And then he'll fix you up. <laughs> he'll fix all the earrings and all the hair and... You'll be delivered from holy pants and all the rest. I'm just having fun with you, okay? Don't worry about that. My girl has holy pants and I don't care. Now, finally, finally, there's application. Application. 
So, meditation requires, number one, apprehension. Number two, assimilation. Number three, you apply it. This is that practical outworking of the process of meditation. Besides building your character in, within you, nourishing your faith, now your life becomes adjusted to what you have been reading and meditating upon. Did you hear that? The word of God takes hold of you, just like food takes hold of your body and makes your body what it is. The word of God takes hold of your spirit and makes you what you ought to be. And next thing you know, you don't want to watch TV anymore. You don't want to do this stuff anymore. It's all empty. You don't want to go to those whatever you go to. Just enjoy the Lord. Life is too short to be uh, full of madness. Madness. No, don't you dare look for a wife somewhere else. Don't look for a husband somewhere else. Get together on that floor and sit there and minister the word and God will tell you who your husband is. He may be that next boy sitting to you there. A lot of the people I knew back then met each other in those meetings on the floor. They would be sharing the word. Any young person who loves the word that much to come and talk about it is worthy of being honored and being known. You sit in church, all you see is somebody's neck. <laughs> Unless they turn around and say hi to you. But you have no chance to talk. You have no chance to get to know them. How will you find a husband by looking at a neck? <laughs> or how do you find a wife by looking at a neck? You sit on the floor and you have that nice circle and have your nice little guitar even if you can't play it just do it <laughs> and sing unto the Lord even if, you're, if, you're, if your voice is not that good who cares and share the word and God will do mighty things with you why don't you do it don't you have this in this church you have it in the school I think it will be wonderful to have them have them in their homes and marvelous I'm telling you, why not? They have a beautiful get together every Friday night and talk about the Bible and see what God will do with you. You will get a healing ministry like that. That's what happened to a lot of these kids when I was growing up. We began praying for the sick. Someone would come and say, oh, I'm feeling that or whatever. Well, let's pray for them. And, the, and God began healing them. It was wonderful. We didn't need the healing evangelist. Or the pastor. God was doing it and amazing all of us. Okay. So, thank you, Bruce. Let's go to Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, as I close. We apply it. I'm going to show you the three secrets all in one verse. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. I love this part. More to be desired are they than gold. That's the word. Can I have your Bible, guys? Because I have mine on my iPad. Just let me, let me have a real Bible. More to be desired are they than gold. Right here. Yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than the honey. There's honey in here, you know that. And the honeycomb. Listen. The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. You want your soul fixed up? Right here. The testimonies of the Lord is sure. There's no lies in it. Making wise the simple. More to be desired are they than gold. That's an old song. It's from the Psalms. 
yeah, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. When I was a kid growing up in church, they would sing, before the pastor ever taught, bless thy word unto our hearts and glorify thy name and the whole church would sing it bless thy word just before the before anybody preached the whole church would sing bless thy word unto our hearts and glorify thy name bless thy word unto our hearts and glorify thy name glorify thy name O Lord glorify thy name bless thy word unto our hearts and glorify thy name and then when when we're all done singing then he could preach I think you need to do that every Sunday night your wife, your, uh, your, your daughter's, your daughter, I said your wife. Your daughter should learn that song. And you should sing it before Michael preaches. Bless thy word unto our hearts and glorify thy name. Come on, let's learn it. Bless thy word unto our hearts and glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Lisa, come up here, help me sing it. Glorify thy name, O Lord. Glorify thy name. That's your mama, mama in law. Bless thy word unto our hearts and glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name, O Lord. Glorify. Your hands and tell him, Bless thy word unto our hearts and glorify thy name. Will you do that on Sunday every so often? I'll be so proud of you. If you do, I'll send you and Michael an offering, it'll be a big offering. Lift your hands, come on, hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let's stand up and bless Him. Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. You know, I just feel, I feel something amazing is about to happen here. Lift your hands, let's bless them. One, glory to the Lamb, quickly. Lord, let your will be done in Jesus' holy name. Glory, come on, with your mom in law. Glory, glory to the Lamb. depart out of thy mouth but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written therein for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then shalt have good success 
This book of the law will not depart out of your mouth, but you'll meditate therein day and night. And when that happens, it says now something will take place here. A vision will happen that thou must observe. You see what happens? You receive information that becomes meditation, and information and meditation produce vision. Vision. I'm sharing that with Chad last night about the tabernacle, and he said, I can see it. He began to imagine what I'm sharing with him. And sometimes that's what happens. A marvelous vision is born that you may observe. And then he said something powerful. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then you'll have good success. Information, meditation, vision. And after it becomes vision, you don't have to worry about being blessed, even in the natural. And we all have read this beautiful psalm. We know it by heart. I used to sit with Oral Roberts, and he would say it out of his heart. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And what then? He shall be like a tree, a tree planted by the rivers of water. Someone who becomes stable, unmovable, Fruitful, it says, fruitful. Planted like a tree that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. And then there's a great promise of healing. It says, his leaf also shall not wither. Even sickness will disappear out of his life. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I gave you a simple clear instruction tonight apprehend it assimilate it apply it lift your hands come on and glory let's worship him
and worthy to be praised. You're the Lamb. Gracious Father, gracious Father, we are so blessed that we are your children. Gracious Father, and we lift our hearts before you as a token of our love. Gracious Father, gracious Father, precious Jesus, oh precious Jesus, we are so glad that you've redeemed us, precious Jesus and we lift our hearts before you as a token of our love precious Jesus precious Jesus just have Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come and fill our hearts anew. Holy That's God's power here. Our hearts before you as I told you. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Shh. Hallelujah. a token Hallelujah Hallelujah Lift your hands to heaven saints guys here. And we lift our hearts before you as a 
a token of our love. Hallelujah. Great future for you. I don't know who you are, but there's a great future for you. Touch him, Lord. Holy. Pick him up a second. Holy. Who is this kid? It's a precious anointing on him. Is the Lamb holy? What's his name? Christian. Christian, I see a ministry being born in you. Is the Lamb? We give you, Lord. The glory evermore holy and Daniel the Lord has not forgotten the prayer spoken over you by your family it's a lot coming your way my brother I see you pulling people. I see you pulling them out of fire. Daniel, I'm talking to you. God is using you and will use you in a deliverance ministry. Deliverance ministry, says the Spirit. You will be casting demons out of people. You will pull them out of fire, says the Lord. Now, Lord, do it in the next two years. Ah. A young man with the hat, come here. We give you the glory. You've been baptized in prayer by some lady. Some lady's been baptized you in prayer when you were a kid. I see a lot of holiness in your past. Oh. Pick him up a second. There is a grandmother or maybe a mom or maybe an aunt. They're gone. Pardon you! Get ready, brother. I want to talk to him. Pick him up. <laughs> What's your name? Emmanuel, what a name. Emmanuel, someone prayed over you when you were a kid. I see a lady praying over you. Everything she asked, God is going to do. It's coming your way, my brother, and there's no running away from it. The Lord, and we give you the glory evermore. Lord, don't forget the promise pick him up come on help me you come on yeah yeah come here can you or not maybe you know you better stay there young man come here come on help me holy 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 is the Lord, the promise. You made the promise to me, Lord. Lord, I establish Emmanuel in ministry. 
as his grandma or mom or some lady back there prayed him in. Establish him in ministry for the rest of his life. No devil will steal that away from him. In the name of Jesus. Now you lift your hands and receive your healing from the Lord. You're holy. I want that girl and that girl. Holy. Let Joshua help you. Pick him up and help so he can work. Hallelujah. That woman there. Lift your hands to heaven. Just bless him now. Michael is with us through social media. Michael, the Lord is telling me to do something. And you're with us now in the spirit here. You're watching us in your home. I'm glad you're home to rest. You've been working so much. But the Lord just told me to Declare the land is yours. Hallelujah. And I declare, Lord Jesus. The land belongs to Michael and Jessica and Jesus' image for your glory. The land you've chosen. The land you've chosen. Hallelujah. And Lord, I pray Everything that must happen will happen. All obstacles are removed. Negotiations will go well. An agreement will be reached. In the name of Jesus. Quickly. Let there be no more delay. Let an agreement take place within weeks. In Jesus' name. I declare it. I ask for it and I declare it. In the name of Jesus. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Now, before I leave, can you pick up these sweet people up? Before I leave, Ryan, there's a great future for you, brother. Come up here a second. Is this your wife? Where is, where is your wife? Oh, bring her, bring her, bring her. Bring her with you here. The Lord calls you a solid rock. Stand right here. You've been called to stand by Jesse and Mike, Michael and Jessica. And the Lord sees you as a rock. He is the rock. But you are a rock. For this ministry I'm talking about. For this ministry. A great stable influence. Be blessed. A great future is yours. And your wife. Great future, great future. Greater than you can imagine, in fact. Much greater than you can imagine. And the darker things get out there, the brighter you will get within. Both of you. Thank you, Lord, for stability. Longevity and great blessings that they will be to this ministry, your work. Give me the praise. Wow. Now, as I stand here and you just stay right where you are, I'm going to ask every one of you that really wants to surrender to the Lord. Because this is a new hour, I can, I, I can tell you with all my heart, our time is running out. This is an amazing, amazing moment for all of us. And I know that dear Michael and Jessica have altar calls, but what I want to do right now is I want to ask every one of you who has not truly, truly dedicated his life or her life to Jesus, don't, don't wait. Don't wait. The time is now to give him your life. And for those who may feel like you've stumbled a little bit, it's okay. The Lord will take care of that too. And those who want to dedicate or rededicate their life, why don't you come from your seats and come stand here? Come here. Quickly, just come out of your spot and just come stand down here. Let the Lord do what he wants with you. Dedicate or rededicate. Just come and start walking down here. You know that beautiful song they sing that at the Tabernacle, uh, Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir? Thank you, Lord, for the cross. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Come, come, help us sing it. Thank you for the price you paid. Taking all our sins and shame. In love you came. And gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Wash me cleansing floor. Stay right here. I know your forgiveness and embrace. Worthy is the land. Seated on. Give me your hand. That's your power of movement. With many crowns, keep singing it. Make 
Come up. part of God is over this kid. I don't know what's wrong with his leg. Is that his wife? Come here, girl. What's wrong with your... Is this your husband, huh? What's wrong with his leg? Huh? Well, pick him up. God, God is healing him. Move it up and down, brother. Pick him up a second. That's glory on him. Where's the pain? Huh? Lord, complete that healing. In the name of Jesus. Well, the Lord's healing him for sure. Now lift your hands to the Lord. I give you my life. I surrender. Just as I am with all the things in my life that don't belong there. I give you my life, my heart, my body, my soul, my all. Use me, Lord. Wash me now. Cleanse me now. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. Establish me in your word. Establish your righteousness in my life. Oh, dear Jesus, I want it now. More than ever, your word alive in me. Your righteousness, your holiness alive in my life. Sin will not touch me. Sin will not dominate me. You will rule my life forever. Now, Lord, you heard that prayer, and I pray you will seal that in their hearts in the mighty name of Jesus. And God's people said, Amen. Let's give the Lord a beautiful hand of prayer. Uh, Chad, you pray with that kid. Some, some, you know, some of you guys that know how to pray, lay hands on him. That leg is, he just needs a little, a little exercise. So, I love you, and I love Michael, and I thank you, and I'll see you soon. In fact, next Sunday, we dedicate our grandbaby here, little Judah. He is cute. Ooh. We're going to all be here, and Suzanne will be here, and we're going to dedicate our grandbaby sometimes next Sunday. Shalom. Here's Jessica. Just, just wanted to thank you, Dad, publicly for just thank you. This generation needs you, so thank you for coming and speaking truth. Thank you. Love you guys. Um, we're going to say good night. Just, just go home with Jesus. Just keep loving on Jesus. That's all I can tell you. And we'll see you next Sunday morning and next Sunday night. Love you all so much. demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus shed his blood. He died.
died on the cross. He was buried. He rose again from the dead on the third day to give you life and to prove that he is the Son of God, who he said he was. Today he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And for those who belong to him, he is interceding for them eternally. And that same Jesus will return again. He will crack the eastern sky like a whip. And with ten thousands upon ten thousands, he will return in glory. In 2017, we received a word from Lou Engel that we really believe is the word of the Lord for our school, our house, and the entire ministry. Lou said that the greatest musicians in the world, and the greatest vocalists in the world, the greatest worshipers, that they would descend upon Orlando, Florida to Jesus' image. And that word began to burn in us, and we began to dream about what it would look like to one day have a school where people would come to worship Jesus and be in his presence and receive his word and a church was birthed in that same worshiping atmosphere. And what a beautiful opportunity that we have as a Jesus people to come before him and to be at his feet and to pour ourselves out before him. Worship has the potential to unlock things that really nothing else in the world can unlock. And so we decided about a year ago to launch a, an opportunity within the Jesus School setting for those worshipers, for the musicians, for the singers, for the dancers, for the artists, for the poets. And this is going to be a place where you can come and you can learn and you can grow. And we have highly trained instructors who are gonna be coming they're going to be teaching instruments, they're going to be teaching vocals. Anything that you can think of with worship, it's going to be there. The worship is not about us. We worship for Him. So we want to invite you to come. Come worship the King of Kings with us. So come and be a part of what the Lord is doing. Come and give your heart to the Lord. Come and surrender yourself to the Lord. And let's be ones that are willing to rise and go. And we decided to name it After Bethany, that wonderful house where Jesus was ministered to, that place where the feelings of Jesus were preeminent. It was a place where he desired to not only move and work and teach and do wonderful things, but a place where he would be adored, a place where he would rest, a place where he would run to so that he would receive ministry. And so now Jesus School, has this space that's been created for all of you who are desiring to use your vocal gifts, your instrumental gifts, your gifts of worship, your dancing gifts, and give them to Jesus. That Jesus would make this a Bethany, that he'd make our lives a Bethany, where he'd come and rest and recline among us. You were created to experience the presence of God in a way that will transform your life, family, and the world. We understand how difficult it can be to find time to attend a school where you study the Word of God, grow in your faith, and build a community of believers. And that's why we created Jesus School Online. We believe that the Holy Spirit is unlimited in His reach. No matter where you live or what stage of life you're in, we invite you to take part in this amazing online opportunity. 
You'll be led by world-renowned speakers and worship leaders. You will be taught to seek Jesus daily. Be activated in the power of the Holy Spirit. Learn to share the gospel and build community with Jesus people from around the world. At Jesus School Online, we are passionate about seeing a Jesus people raised up to shake the nations for the glory of God. You were created for this moment in history. The Jesus people are emerging and we have one ambition. Jesus himself. Will you join us?